Hello, my name is Dr. Mark Solkowski. I'm from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. There I serve as the medical director of the Viral Hepatitis Center. Welcome to this educational activity focused on the interdisciplinary management of hepatitis C. Joining me in this discussion are Dr. Ira Jacobson. Ira is a hepatologist and a liver specialist at Mount Sinai Beth Israel and the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Also joining me is Dr. Trang Vu, who is also the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, but has a different practice and that she is trained as a primary care physician. Welcome, Ira. Welcome, Trang. Thank you for joining me. Pleasure to be with you, Mark. Thank you for having us. The following audio is part of a certified educational activity titled Emerging Issues and Challenges for Improving HCV Patient Care, Expert Perspectives on the Importance of Interdisciplinary Collaboration. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at www.peerreviewpress.com forward slash GDQ. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. As many as 5 million Americans live with chronic hepatitis C infection. However, many individuals are unaware of their infection. That's in part because hepatitis C is spread silently through contaminated blood and other modes of transmission, and in part because it's largely asymptomatic. Many people just simply don't know they're hepatitis C infected. Now, we've always known that hepatitis C can lead to progressive liver disease, cirrhosis, liver cancer, liver transplant, and death. In fact, in the current era, the CDC estimates more than 20,000 Americans die every year of complications of hepatitis C, more than die of HIV and 59 other infectious pathogens reported to the Centers for Disease Control. In that landscape, we now have the opportunity to deliver curative therapy. Treatment for hepatitis C in the 1990s and 2000s involved interferon-based therapies that caused side effects and often did not work. But since 2014, we've had oral direct acting antivirals that provide high rates of virologic cure across a wide range of patients and a wide range of hepatitis C genotypes. So in that context, there's been a lot of excitement about the concept that we might be able to eliminate hepatitis C, and we're discussing that in the U.S. and certainly in other parts of the world. Yet there are many challenges. As I mentioned, many people are unaware of their infection, and we need to diagnose them, link them to care, which leads us to another challenge. There's only a limited number of specialists, typically hepatologists, gastroenterologists, and infectious disease providers that have the capacity and the skill set right now to treat hepatitis C, and there are concerns that they may not be geographically linked to the patients, or they may not have the room in their clinical practice to take on this large volume of people. In that context, we need to increase the availability of community-based, non-specialist hepatitis C care. And typically, we mean through primary care providers and centers that deal with patients' full range of medical problems. And in fact, the WSLD, the Liver Society, and the IDSA, the Infectious Disease Society, have published guidelines that talk about the treatment itself, but really talk about the need for an interdisciplinary care model that involves the close collaboration of primary care practitioners with hepatitis C specialists, as well as other healthcare providers, think pharmacists, nurses, community outreach workers. So in that context, we've got a lot to talk about in how to manage hepatitis C. So oftentimes we talk about the delivery of medical care as a care continuum or cascade. And in general, that starts with the identification of patients with the disease. In this case, it starts with screening persons who may be at risk for hepatitis C. And this has been actually a major barrier to finding people and linking them to care. So I'd like to ask both of you your experiences with screening patients and let me start with Trang. I know you work in a primary care setting on Mount Sinai. What have you done with respect to trying to identify these millions of Americans are infected? And here in New York City, there's 
hundreds of thousands are infected. Well, in New York State, we have a mandate to screen all baby boomers. Uh, so we do have a system set up so that all baby boomers born between the years of 1945 and 1965 are automatically flagged by our electronic medical record system so that our providers know to order the screening tests for those patients. And our electronic medical record system has the ability to look back two years to see if they've ever been screened. And if not, then there's a prompt to get them screened. Furthermore, in our clinic, we also identify a lot of our patients who are people who are currently substance, uh, using substances, uh, such as uh, IV drug use. So we have a system where we screen for IV drug use and we ask for um, whether or not they've been screened in the past for hepatitis C, and we try to screen those patients. Obviously, the USPTF also recommends screening in other patient populations, like patients who have chronic long-term hemodialysis or patients who have HIV co-infection. So keeping those in mind, we try to identify those patients and screen those patients. So it's really two groups of people, the mm -hmm. uh, so-called baby boomers who may have been exposed unknowingly back mm -hmm. in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And I know that there's been some challenge in getting clinicians, particularly primary care clinicians, to screen people who they don't perceive may have been at risk, yet mm -hmm. We know that some of these people are at risk just through exposure to blood. Okay. Now, New York State has taken the unusual step of mandating screening, but other parts of the United States, that screening is not mandated. Have you seen resistance from primary care clinicians to order that test on a 60-year-old individual with no perceived risk? Actually, no. I think that um, in general, the public has actually taken up the screening as a positive thing. Um, a lot of my patients come in and said, I never knew that if my doctors didn't test my, for hep C. So a lot of times, actually, a lot of my patients were like, why wasn't I screened earlier? Why, why did I not get identified you know, 10 years ago before I developed cirrhosis? So I think a lot of Patients are expecting to get screened, and they, they think it's part of the routine blood work. Um, and so it's a relief when they find out. And so there's another group of people. Unfortunately, hepatitis C new cases are increasing relatively rapidly as part of this opioid epidemic in the U.S. How are you reaching out to those people? Many of these are young adults that really aren't coming to you. Right. They may be going to addiction treatment centers. Um, are they being screened in that context? Um, yes, I agree with you. That patient population is a little bit more challenging to engage. They're not actually coming into regular primary care clinics or even specialist clinics. But we have an outreach team, and I think a lot of it is just community affiliations. Um, we are well connected with our methadone programs or the outpatient drug treatment programs as well as shelters. The prison system is also starting to screen um, more widely now, so it's we're getting our referrals through those routes. So a really a widespread effort across the spectrum of patients. Now, Ira, you run a specialty practice where you've been treating up to IC for a number of years. That's right. When you see patients coming to you, I imagine they've been diagnosed in some fashion. Are, are you seeing people that were identified through this effort to screen baby boomers? I'm seeing them, but I'm not seeing enough of them to be convinced that there's been anything close to maximum uptake mm -hmm. of the current screening guidelines, either promulgated by the CDC or U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, or even by New York state law. So I, I think we've got a good deal uh, more work to do. So I'm interested, when you see a new patient who is newly diagnosed, how are they finding out? Is it uh, a life insurance screen? Is it uh, a test done in some other fashion? A lot of it is uh, similar, more similar than it probably should be in the context of the new screening guidelines to what I've heard for many years. Uh, I had an a elevated liver test or an elevated ALT, as, as we say in medicine, uh, or an insurance exam. I've had a number of patients say that they themselves were aware of the screening guideline and asked their doctor to do it rather than necessarily the other way around. And then, of course, a lot of primary care doctors are getting it right. Um, but there's a collective impression, and I think some of it is also based on pharmaceutical data, that there's a decrease in the number of people who are initiating therapy these days. So uh, given the millions of people that were constantly told have hepatitis C in the United States, and I believe those data, something seems to be wrong. And I think that there needs to be further uptake of these screening guidelines. Well, we raised a number of very interesting points, and one is actually educating patients themselves, 
uh, the population about the risk of hepatitis C. And the other is getting more and more people involved in screening, whether it's uh, healthcare providers working in corrections, in addiction medicine, primary care medicine, or perhaps uh, OBGYN practitioners as well. So mm -hmm. I think you're right. There's a, a big need for a wider approach to this. And certainly in the U.S., we think a number of patients are still undiagnosed. The CDC suggests that as many as half of the patients living with chronic hepatitis C have yet to be identified. And if I could interject, Mark, as you well know, both of you, there's been the beginning of some talk that maybe baby boomers aren't, aren't enough. Right. And that we should be, especially in light of this social tragedy that's playing out, that's right. resulting in deaths from opiate addiction and acquisition of new hepatitis C at a sort of second younger age peak, maybe we ought to think about screening all adults, at least on a one-time basis. It's certainly been discussed, and there have been uh, cost-effectiveness models put together suggesting that might be a cost-effective approach. Of course, uh, having that become a policy uh, is, a, is another step, but I think we all agree that there are still a number of patients not yet diagnosed, yet there are the availability of screening tests, and we'll talk about those uh, in the next couple of minutes. Well, the first step to identifying a person with hepatitis C is testing. So let's talk a little bit about the types of tests that we use. Now, typically, we'll screen with an antibody test. So, Trang, how, what's being done at Mount Sinai? I imagine there's a typical phlebotomy where the patient can be uh, ordered a test to go down and get their blood drawn. Are you using the rapid testing technology, this uh, finger stick uh, rapid test that gets a result in about 20 minutes? Is that something you're using? No, in our institution, we use uh, in-house phlebotomy blood work. So uh, we have the hepatitis C antibody test that reflexes to the hepatitis C RNA if the antibody is positive. So we're very fortunate to have that in-house. I know at some other institutions, they may not have that availability. Um, we use the Orishore rapid testing in our community outreach efforts. So when we're out in the clinics in the community, that's when we use the rapid test because we do not have the availability of a phlebotomy lab and, or the availability of time. These are patients that we want to engage in the moment. And so we'll use the Orishore test at, in the community. I know the rapid testing has been useful at screening events. So yeah. I know in Baltimore, where I practice, they'll, they'll go to a community health fair or church or uh, some other group and set up a testing booth. And yes. uh, generally can identify a fair number of people. And we, it is does return a positive antibody result, which indicates exposure to hepatitis mm -hmm. C, but doesn't really tell you whether that person has active infection and might warrant treatment. So you mentioned these reflex testing. So you order the antibody, and I, by reflex you mean you don't have to order another test. The lab does it for you. That's correct. Um, and basically, the, our phlebotomists know to draw two tubes, and one tube is saved just in case the RNA needs to be run. And so if the antibody is positive, that patient's uh, tube will then be run for the RNA. Uh, we used to have to order it separately, but now we have reflex testing that cuts out that uh, delay. And that is certainly commercially available as well from some of the large uh, national labs. Mm -hmm. So I assume when you see a patient, they've had an antibiotic test, but have they typically already been confirmed with a positive hepatitis C RNA? The CDC guidelines do say antibody, if positive, they would actually expect the group or individual that screened that person to go ahead and get the RNA test. Mm -hmm. So are you seeing patients that walk in with just the antibodies? That happen? Occasionally, but I think my primary care and gastroenterology colleagues are generally doing a very good job in getting the PCR so that I do know whether patients have iremic mm -hmm. at the time that I see them. Remember also that gastroenterologists and hepatologists don't necessarily see patients after they've had the test. Uh, we have our usual battery of uh, tests for virologic uh, and autoimmune and genetic etiologies, as well, of course, as thinking about fatty liver and getting an ultrasound on the enormous numbers of people who see us for elevated liver tests of uncertain etiology. So they may come to you without the hepatitis C antibody test? Yes, and then the only time I don't do the reflex test now is that I forget that it exists because it's a recent development. We should be doing it all the time when we order a hep C antibody. And unfortunately, that's one of the places where I think the testing algorithm falls down because a lot of times the individual gets the antibody test, but there may be uncertainty among the 
primary care clinician or the patient just doesn't come back right. and doesn't get the opportunity to have phlebotomy. Now, although there's a finger stick test for antibody, it is a routine phlebotomy blood draw. And I know that that's a place where we have tr pe trouble getting people back. So, Trang, when you go to the community, how do you get them in for that phlebotomy? We actually have dedicated community patient navigators and also peer navigators to engage with the community members so that if they're antibody positive, we try to bring them. And actually sometimes they have to be escorted into clinic for the RNA testing. It is time intensive, body intensive. So um, if we could do the RNA testing out in the community, we, could to we would totally go that route. But because the Orishore is more cost effective at this point. Now there is some effort to develop point of care testing for things like hep C antigen and even uh, viral testing, but that's really not here yet and I don't know we'll see it in the near future. So at one point uh, you get that test result back so they're antibody positive, RNA positive. Uh, is that a person that you want to see in your practice to discuss treatment and other uh, liver healthy uh, factors? Yes, we bring back all of our RNA positive patients for a counseling session because I think that when they hear those news, uh, a slew of emotions come out. A lot of patients are devastated that they have hepatitis C. A lot of patients are relieved to know that they've been diagnosed early. Um, so any gamut of emotions could come out. And so I personally like to have a sit down one-on-one -on -one meeting with those patients to tell them their results. Yeah, so part of it is not just go see the specialist, but what does this mean? Yes. And I certainly always want people to know that there are curative treatments. We yes. can cure hepatitis C. It's actually a good thing we found it. All right, let me ask you about the other side of that, where some people test positive for the antibody, and they are negative for hepatitis C RNA. How do you handle those people? Generally, in a very reassuring way, uh, there are two scenarios that can lead to that discordance of a positive antibody and a negative PCR. Uh, one is past infection. We have to remember that about 25% of human beings immunologically are able to clear acute hepatitis C after a few weeks or months. And then there are false positive tests where somebody has a positive antibody, but it's an antibody protein that's in their body because it developed in response to some other antigen in the past. We used to have a nice test called a REBA test, a recombinant immunoblot assay, that would make that distinction nicely for us. Uh, for some reason, that was removed from the market, so we really can't do that. But the good news is that even for patients who used to be REBA positive, denoting genuine prior infection, it was exceedingly rare to ever see the virus again. Although your colleague, David Thomas, did once publish a study showing that a small percent do pop up with virus again. So when I had that scenario, and to this day still do, I'll test them again in a year or two just to make sure that it's still negative. But I've never seen an exception to that. And I think that really highlights the reason why the CDC stresses antibody is the rapid screen test. It's low cost, mm -hmm. can be done either in the lab or by finger stick quickly. But that alone is not enough to confirm they're actually infected. They need that RNA test. In fact, I've seen people who have live for years thinking they were chronically affected because they never had the RNA test. And they go from thinking they've got this chronic liver disease that may cause cirrhosis, other calamities, and now you tell them they're, they're free of hepatitis. Those are very happy consultations. They're some of my favorite consultations, yes. and they're, they're pretty quick. So it is important that patients have both the antibody as well as the RNA test. Correct. Well, so we have a patient who's antibody positive, RNA positive. If it's been present for at least six months, we call that chronic hepatitis C. Those people need to be evaluated uh, by someone who can potentially treat and cure their hepatitis C. But there's a lot of issues on the table. So I, I want to ask each of you, what do you do when someone walks in with a new diagnosis? So a person who walks into your office, Ira, what, what is your first step with that person? Well, the first thing I do is present myself with as reassuring a demeanor as possible because of the revolutionary advances recently that have uh, helped us attain a state of near universal curability. It's also very important to be sensitive to the fact that many patients will feel a sense of not only fear for their future health or even life, but a sense of stigmatization because that's the traditional association with hepatitis C because of the unfortunate ways in which the virus is often transmitted. 
Uh, with all of that in mind, it is important to take a history of risk factors, although I hasten to reassure the patient that I'm really only asking, not because it matters how they got it, but that it helps me determine how long they've had it, mm -hmm. so that I can put the current findings about fibrosis and liver function in the context of a, uh, in a chronologic context. Um, of course, we take a full history, do a complete physical, and then I explain the other tests that I'm going to do. So more often than not, a genotype has not been obtained. And I think uh, for the short term, at least, that will remain a staple of practice. So is it your expectation that when a patient comes to see you as a specialist, typically they won't have had a genotype test, which is a test designed to identify the specific strain and, yes. uh, that they're infected with? And typically it's one, two, or three in the U.S., but uh, at least when I see new patients, they usually don't have that test done. That's correct. Unless it's a primary care uh, provider who does an awful lot of this, they usually don't get a genotype first. And that's fine as long as they've made the referral. Um, and the other thing that I would emphasize in answer to your original question is the importance of assessing the degree of fibrosis. And it's a very important message for our primary care colleagues that even if they choose to undertake treatment themselves, it's critical to this day to assess the degree of hepatic fibrosis in patients. So, yeah, I, I really talk to patients about liver scarring, and, I, and people really can't feel scarring. There is this perception that if your liver were... Uh, cirrhotic, you would know it. And the reality of it is, until it becomes very dysfunctional, you don't really feel it. So, now, to get one thing out on the table, you're not doing liver biopsies for hepatitis C. Is that, uh, is that true in your practice? I've not done a hep C liver biopsy in at least three years, I would say. I, I never thought I would say that, but it's true. And that's been always a major barrier. Patients didn't want to come see me because the fear that they, I would actually do a biopsy in that first visit. So liver biopsies are no longer used. We're using blood tests and uh, non-invasive strategies to stage their liver disease. And we'll come back to that point in, in terms of treatment, but try and let me come to you. So you're, you've got patients you're newly diagnosing. Um, Ira has laid out some of the testing to do and the, the staging. How do you deal with some of the other issues that patients deal with? I know that uh, when I talk to people, they're concerned about their, their diet. Alcohol comes up. Transmission to family members. Are there are there children at risk, these types of things. So, so walk me through how you're handling that kind of gamut of, of things that patients deal with. Right. So our initial visit with our patient is a dedicated visit just to make sure that we answer all questions that the patient might have and address some of the misconceptions uh, that patients have as well. We hear a lot of stories about, well, I don't have jaundice, so there's no way I can have hepatitis C or, or cirrhosis. And so we try to break that down. We do have an education model at the beginning where one of our care coordinators or our social workers deliver to our patient about what hep C means and, and the treatment going forth. Um, we try to be good primary care doctors so that when, when we need to uh, refer to our specialist, we get a complete history and physical, especially uh, a good history of risk uh, assessment, so how they might have gotten hep C in the past. Um, their drug and alcohol use history as well, current and past, so that we have a, a gauge of what to counsel them for when they're done with uh, treatment. We also go through a very extensive psychosocial readiness interview uh, with our patients outside of the medical assessments that Dr. Jacobson just mentioned. You know, um, One of the tools that we use in our clinic is called PREP-C. It was developed by one of my colleagues, Dr. Jeff Weiss. Um, it is available online at prepc.org. There's several different modules that address a whole gamut of psychosocial um, issues, including social support, uh, financial, transportation, etc. It is time consuming. It does take our social worker about 30 minutes to complete the prepsy with a straightforward patient. Um, a not so straightforward person can take up to an hour. But if a primary care provider just wants a quick and easy way of assessing psychosocial readiness, we do recommend the SAMHSA CAGE aid tool that's available online, and the slide has the uh, link to that uh, tool. We find that it helps us to identify potential barriers to patients completing treatment, but it also answers some of the insurance company's requests for a psychosocial readiness assessment. So that helps to eliminate one barrier to getting the prior authorization. So you touched on a couple of things. I want to come back to them about drug and alcohol use. We know that there is this um, high prevalence of both drug use and alcohol use among some hep C infected individuals, not all. 
We generally advise our patients not to drink alcohol with chronic hepatitis C for concerns that it may pro- uh, cause liver disease progression. But increasingly, there's been a real emphasis by guidelines, panels, and other expert groups that that should not be a barrier to treatment. Okay. That the use of alcohol, though we advise patients with chronic hepatitis C reduce or preferably abstain, that we don't uh, withhold treatment in that context, which is not always the case. Uh, so, Ira, let me ask you, are you a patient that's still drinking? How do you approach that? Do you, uh, in terms of their uh, best advice for the liver as well as access to treatment? Well, I think by the question you mean problematic drinking, a level of alcohol consumption that we know can lead to progressive liver disease or synergize or contribute in an additive way to the progressive fibrosis engendered by HCV infection, because I'm amongst those who believe that a little bit of alcohol consumption in the setting of demonstrably chronic hepatitis C that you now have shown is associated with very little fibrosis is okay. Now, you can fool yourself sometimes if you have too much confidence in your ability to glean who may be fooling you and who may not be. But I do get to trust the representations of most of my patients when I have a repeated discussion with them. And they're consistent, and there's a partner sitting there who nods in affirmation that the patient really doesn't drink very much. Um, But with regard to heavy alcohol consumption, you're absolutely right. I don't make cessation of the practice a a condition of treatment, just as we don't make it a condition in people who are using active drugs uh, drugs actively anymore, and that's that's a whole other discussion. Mm -hmm. But we certainly want to counsel patients to stop. And for patients who've really been heavy drinkers in the past, to me, although I'm not a psychologist with expertise in this area, there's very little negotiation. Those are people who've had a demonstrable problem in the past, And there's no way that I feel comfortable negotiating a safe amount of alcohol. Those patients in my practice have to stop. Well, you raise a good point. I think the the whole hepatitis C treatment uh, encounter can be as a a bit of a a carrot, if you will. It's an opportunity to engage that person. I've certainly seen people adopting healthier lifestyles as they engage in something very positive, curative treatment. I want to come back to the point you made about uh, active drug use. So, Trank, the population that you're seeing in your practice may actively be using, uh, in some cases injecting. How do you approach that in terms of treatment readiness? Is that is that a no-go or how do you deal with that? Well, I agree with Dr. Jacobson. We actually do not have it as a limitation to treatment access. Um, we do have a fair share of our patients who are currently using injection drugs um, or cocaine, intranasal drugs like cocaine. So. Um, we, identi- we ask them to, to identify their use so that we can provide the appropriate counseling, provide uh, appropriate referrals to addiction services if they're interested. Um, we also ad- use that information to guide how often we'd like to monitor the patient on, uh, on treatment. So part of the success that we've seen with our clinic is that we individualize our patient's care. So not everybody gets the same cookie cutter treatment. Mm -hmm. So some patients, if they're high needs, we actually have more engagement with our social workers, with our care navigators. Um, And if they're sort of urinal run of the mill patients, then we kind of see them on a less regular basis. So you make a good point that really you can engage and tailor your approach to the patient's needs and try to link them into perhaps opiate substitution therapy, uh, in the case of alcohol, Uh, programs to address alcoholism. So I I think there are a number of ways you can use this as a positive way uh, rather than an obstacle to care. Mm -hmm. So a a couple of of questions about uh, the cirrhotic patient. What do you generally recommend? Uh, Imaging studies, uh, endoscopy, how do you approach that patient? Well, yes, it's uh, really standard of care to uh, screen every patient with documented cirrhosis for esophageal or esophagogastric varices because we do have effective means of primary prophylaxis against an initial bleed, which can be a life-threatening event, as you well know. And uh, we could talk in more detail uh, offline about how often to do that, but generally it's every one to three years, depending on the patient and the level of uh, decompensation. Uh, Some people are now saying that if you don't have splenomegaly and or a low platelet count below a certain degree, it may not be necessary. But I think the standard of care still is to screen cirrhotics. Most importantly, and I emphasize this to patients as the most important thing I'm going to tell them, is to remember to get screened with imaging, the alpha-fetoprotein is optional at this point, every six months 
The standard in the guidelines is ultrasound, but many hepatologists feel that particularly for patients with advanced cirrhosis who have very heterogeneous livers or obese patients or those with, quote, indeterminate lesions or those whose radiology reports say, you know we can't visualize the liver optimally in cirrhosis with uh, sonography. Once a radiologist says that, you're done. You really have to rely on something else. And we do a lot of MRI with contrast in our practice, trying to avoid the serial radiation exposures that would be engendered by CT, even though it's admittedly more expensive. That screening has to continue even after a patient is virologically cured, according to current concepts, even if it appears that the patient's cirrhosis has regressed. So it's important to note that hep C-related cirrhosis is a major driver of hepatocellular carcinoma. So Trang, as a primary care-trained clinician, uh, Ira has talked about the cirrhotic patient, the possibility of variceal bleeding, liver cancer. When do you decide that you need to refer and collaborate with a, a hepatologist or gastroenterologist? What's your threshold and how do you divvy up that care? Um, so, personally, I feel comfortable enough to manage patients uh, with uh, early uh, compensated cirrhosis, so child pew class A, um, and that basically is just through blood work, and we calculate that uh, on a, the M MD calc online for whether or not they're child pew class A or B or C. Um, afterwards, if they're B or C, then I start to collaborate with my fellow gastroenterologists or hepatologists. But I feel comfortable. I mean, I think it depends on the primary care physicians out there. At the very least, I think um, primary care providers can order the uh, initial hepatitis, uh, HCC screening ultrasound and or CAT scan and then refer to hepatology if they don't know what to do with the results, especially if the results are abnormal. Um, I also agree that patients need to be referred for the initial screening EGG um, study, especially if they're newly diagnosed cirrhotic. May I make one point, Mark? I, I just yeah. want to get this out for our colleagues who are watching. We've talked about assessment for fibrosis. We've talked about cirrhosis. I want to make sure the word elastography gets mentioned once during the program. We talked about blood testing for mm -hmm. fibrosis before. Most hepatologists now combine one of the blood tests that are either commercially available or can be calculated with an online tool like the FIB4 or even the APRI. But uh, our, the lifeblood of assessing for fibrosis for most hepatologists now is elastography, which essentially measures the velocity of transmission through the liver of a shear wave set up by ultrasound pulses. And I think most people are familiar with it. The most common yeah. device is called FibroScan, but there are other types of shear wave elastography as well as MR. And uh, I think the best way to assess for fibrosis uh, and uh, to conclude that somebody has cirrhosis to get both a blood test and elastography, the only risk there being that you can get discordant results and then you have to make up your mind what you think the patient really has, or rarely nowadays do a liver biopsy to resolve the issue. Yeah, so certainly we do have access to elastography. It's a very valuable tool and does have some prognostic information. The more stiff the liver gets, the more likely it is to have events. But I think primary care doctors are not going to have a fiber scan or a transient elastography machine readily available. So most of the time we end up just relying on the blood mm -hmm. work. I've heard of some primary care providers relying on ultrasound results to sort of gauge whether or not a patient is cirrhotic. Um, and I, I mean, I think the sensitivity is very low for the ultrasound. Um, so I would recommend against using ultrasound only as a gauge of whether or not your patient's cirrhotic. I agree. And of course, my comments don't apply if it's obvious. The, the ultrasound that shows gross cirrhosis with nodules and a platelet count of 50,000, of course you have your answer. We're talking about other kinds of patients. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Imaging studies can't really rule out cirrhosis. They can rule it in. Yeah. And, but some radiology centers are combining traditional ultrasound with elastography, and perhaps that will become increasingly available. So I think the point to, just to make here is there is a point with advanced liver disease where it's not about the virus. It's more about the liver care and perhaps even transplant. Mm -hmm. But let's move back and talk about treatment because our goal is to screen people, find them before the livers are so sick, link them into care, and cure them. So fortunately, we have a lot of hepatitis C treatment options that have been approved by the FDA and the guidelines panel from the Liver Society and the IT Society uh, do a really a fantastic job of updating recommendations for genotype 1, 2, 3, even 4, 5, and 6 infection. And they update this 
nearly in real time. So a new regimen's approved and the guidelines change and they can be found at uh, hcvguidelines.org. So there's a lot of options available. Some of these are one pill once a day. Some require more pills. Some require one of the older drugs, ribavirin. But importantly, none of them include interferon. Mm -hmm. But let me ask each of you, how do you decide when you're sitting down with a patient um, how you're going to treat them? Uh, what information do you want to know? Uh, are you concerned about uh, drug interactions, for example, concerned about uh, metabolism of the uh, HCV drugs. What, what steps do you take to pick these out? And all right, let me start with you. What, how do you go through that with your patients? Let's first establish, and hopefully agree amongst ourselves, that all of the recommended regimens in the uh, almost biblically important HCV guidelines of ASLD and IDSA are of equivalent efficacy. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they wouldn't be amongst the frontline recommended regimens, which only makes the dilemma more difficult. You're absolutely right, Mark, that drug-drug interactions, uh, even sometimes involving proton pump inhibitors, which of course are widely used, particularly in higher doses, can be relevant with certain regimens, certain of our drugs, uh, like acid around, and if you suppress it too much, the absorption might be impaired. Um, other regimens might have protease inhibitors in them that tend to have a little bit more in the way of drug-drug interactions with other agents like statins for which adjustments might need to be made and that's just one of several examples I could give. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of what the patient's carrier will, will pay for and there it's fortunate the, the regimens have equivalent efficacy. The one thing that I will fight like crazy about to get for patients if everything else is equal is a regimen that doesn't have ribavirin rather than one that does. Okay. Unless you need the ribavirin to get you over the top in terms of a distinctly uh, extra margin of uh, confidence that the patient will be cured. I think it's worth noting that we, in addition to equal efficacy, most of the regimens are either eight or 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few circumstances where the treatment could be as long as 24 weeks, but really we're talking about three months for the typical person. So you raise a good point, and I suppose in one of the things in taking that history, an accurate medication list, as well as potential herbals, things like St. John's wort that can have serious uh, drug interactions is important. And there are these tools uh, available online to help, and we, we use a clinical pharmacist. Me, uh, do you collaborate with clinical pharmacists in your groups? I've been envious of your arrangement for years. We don't have such a collaboration, so we're on our own, but I am blessed to have a team of nurses and nurse practitioners who are very good about this. Yes, I'm also envious. We do not have a clinical pharmacist on site. Um, but a lot of the hep C medic, well, all of them uh, require a specialty pharmacy uh, in order to process the prescription and, and deliver to the patients. So our, we've partnered with a really good specialty pharmacy where their pharmacists uh, on the back end check for interactions and then would send us a, a, a warning email or a, a suggestion email, you know, maybe you know, stop the PPI, stop the statin. Yeah, I think it's really a three-level look for drug interactions. One is the clinician, uh, the second is the pharmacist, and then online tools are also quite helpful. So we mentioned drug interactions, and uh, are there other decision factors? Uh, so, Trank, let me ask you, if you've got a patient with cirrhosis, um, how, would you how do you approach that patient? Do you shy away from some regimens and favor others? Is there a preference? Um, well, with decompensated cirrhosis, some of the regimens are not uh, FDA approved for. So I try to make sure, first of all, that my patient has compensated cirrhosis before I engage in conversations about treatment plans because certain treatment plans are off the table if they're decompensated. Um, and then otherwise, if they're well compensated, I treat them pretty much the same way as my non cirrhotic patients. All of the treatment regimens are equally effective in our. Um, cirrhotic, uh, compensated cirrhotic patients. The only thing that's different in my patient population is because we have more of the substance user and um, we have more patients with psychiatric comorbidities. I am more careful uh, in trying to avoid ribavirin, probably fight tooth and nail to not get the ribavirin regimen because there is a lot more, in my experience at least, psychiatric side effects with ribavirin, so we try to avoid that in our more complicated patients. And so it's worth noting that two of the regimens that include protease inhibitors, um, one, Elbasvir or that's ribavirin-free, mm -hmm. except if there's resistance testing. I don't want to get into that too much, but 
most patients can take it without ribavirin if they're infected with 1A. But grisopavir, as you pointed out, is not something to use if your liver is decompensated. So it's important you know that. And then, of course, the other regimen that requires ribavirin for most patients with 1A infection is this uh, paratapavir, ritonavir, and bisvir, dusabavir, the so-called 3D regimen. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit, I share your views of avoiding ribavirin when I can because it is a BID, twice daily drug, mm -hmm. and it induces a little bit of insomnia and about a two gram decline in hemoglobin. And in this day and age, I tell patients, you're not gonna have side effects, and, and that kind of undermines that message. Right. And the teratogenicity in younger yes. people. That's a, that's a great point. Yeah. Right. Ribavirin, you have to avoid pregnancy for six months after your last dose. Yeah. So I think we all agree that ribavirin is, is something we try to avoid, are there other uh, concerns you have? And let me ask you about renal impairment. Yes. Uh, one of the common regimens we use that typically is used without ribavirin is ledipasvir, sofosvir, or velpatasvir, sofosvir. But uh, is that something you're using in people with impaired renal function? No, just as we're not supposed to use protease inhibitors, and, and rightly so because of pharmacokinetic issues in decompensated cirrhotic patients, so we are not supposed to use nucleotide polymerase inhibitors, of which the only current example on the market is cefosprevir, others in development, in patients with renal insufficiency or renal failure, and specifically with GFRs less than 30 milliliters uh, per minute. And that's because the major metabolite of cefosprevir accumulates about 20-fold in people certainly with overt or advanced renal failure. There are anecdotal case series, as you both well know, suggesting that it's okay mm -hmm but it's against the label, and there are wonderful alternatives right now, as shown with the regimen that you mentioned of crisopravir elbisphere, with lesser numbers of patients, the paratapravir uh, containing regimen, and at least one regimen that's upcoming that also doesn't have a nucleotide polymerase inhibitor, but rather second generation protease and NS5A inhibitor that appears to be extremely effective in renal failure patients. So I think the point to make is that in, there's a few things I have to look at, liver function, kidney function, the strain of hepatitis C, but in general we found, and of course drug interactions, but we found we can generally match a drug regimen with a patient and have great outcomes. So I tell patients that I, I can find the right treatment for them. I, I, I agree, sometimes insurance companies will have preferred regimens, and that, that brings up this issue of cost. Uh, patients bring it up, um, we deal with that, uh, what do you, how do you talk to patients about the cost of therapy? They often ask. Um, Trang, what do you tell them when they, if they raise that issue? Well, I try to tell them that the goal is to get them cured, and that's priceless. Um, so, and that the cost actually just comes up when the insurance companies are, are looking to see whether they're a candidate for treatment. Um, for us, we try to choose the best regimen available for the patient, um, and we have a team of, of navigators that do the prior authorization process to help us out. I know that's a luxury that many primary care doctors do not have, um, so it's good to build a relationship with a specialty pharmacy because they will more likely than not have a lot of experience in dealing with the insurance companies and tell you like what is the preferred regimen. But um, a lot of times I think my patients get very impressed when they find out how much their medications cost and they value it more, and so they're more likely to take it religiously every day. So it's an interesting point, and the cost of treatment uh, in some settings, so for example in the Veterans Affairs healthcare system, reportedly have come down dramatically such that that VA system is now offering treatment to everyone. And we're starting to see that more and more across different healthcare sectors, which of course is quite complicated in the United States. Right. So, and I should also add that models that look at cost effectiveness show that the prevention of liver cancer, liver failure, transplant, uh, really does add uh, cost savings to the system when you get to a certain threshold for price. So it does come up, but the biggest issue is dealing with this uh, insurance authorization. And you mentioned having teams of pharmacists and others that help with that. We have been able to get most patients linked to care mm -hmm. and to treatment. That's been our experience. So let me, let me move on. To, so you've got the patient on treatment. You've been successful in getting them through the 8, 12 weeks of therapy, and they're now cured. So let me ask you first, do you use the word cure? Do you tell them they're cured? 
So I don't tell them immediately after they're done treatment. I wait until the 12 weeks after treatment to say whether or not they've been cured. And I advise them that there is a small percentage uh, of patients that do have virologic relapse, even they've, if they've done the medications 100% correctly. Um, and so we monitor them at post-treatment week four and then at post-treatment week 12. Anecdotally, there's been some late relapses beyond post-treatment week 12. So we've um, sort of changed our strategy a little bit to ha bring the patients back at post-treatment week 24 just to be 100% certain. Um, but we do tell patients that they're cured at post-treatment week 12 if their lab work show uh, undetectable viral load. In our, so at what point, so you stop treatment, and we know from the clinical trials there's about a 3% chance. That's, a, that's an average, maybe a little lower in some groups, uh, but the virus will come back, meaning you didn't eliminate it all, as Trang was referring to. When do you feel comfortable in telling that person they're cured of cr chronic hepatitis C? I tell them that I'm virtually certain they're cured beyond the 12-week time point, but I have an end a reputation of being an endless warrior to live up to, as you know, and I test patients out to a year. There are indeed some reports of very rare late relapsers, mm -hmm. one or two in a thousand perhaps, with a couple of the regimens. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's regimen specific. And I don't want to miss any of those patients or take the slightest chance thereof in my practice, but I haven't seen it. So I, I, with a, a large experience in this field, fortunately, I'm able to tell patients that I've never seen it, even as I simultaneously tell them to come back at the one-year time point to make sure, and they don't seem to mind at all. They're related at 12 weeks. So I have to admit, I, maybe I picked this up from you, but I also <laughs> see patients back at one year. I find it's a, a nice time to reconnect, recap the, the things we talked about with respect to healthy liver lifestyle, uh, address other issues with respect to their health. <clears throat> and then at that point in time, we may consider that they're done with hepatitis C. I, I think of it as closing a chapter, but there's a few times I worry, and one of them is, uh, this came up a little bit earlier, about reinfection. Right. So there is no vaccine for hepatitis C, and there's no immunity. So, mm -hmm. Trang, I know you've talked about seeing people who are injecting. What, what messages do you give about the potential for reinfection? Well, first of all, I just want to start off with saying that our clinic, we're very lucky. We have not seen a single reinfection case, even though we do have a, a fair number of people who are using drugs. So um, we counsel them very early on. So even when we start them on treatment, we say, this is a cure. This is not a vaccine. While you're taking this medication, don't share needles, don't share razors, toothbrushes, et cetera, that could get you infected. Um, and then afterwards, we continue that message uh, even through their post-treatment week 12 uh, appointment. Um, and we, with our patients that are currently actively using, we might bring them back sooner than three months out or a year out. Um, so we might bring them back on a every three month period after they're treated just to make sure that they're not reinfected. So we have a similar practice in that uh, in the patients where we believe the risk of reinfection is quite low, perhaps a baby boomer uh, who got it through a transfusion, we won't check again after that one year. But those folks, I do think they need repeat HCV RNAs mm -hmm. and visits. Uh, we're doing it every six to 12 months, but I think that's an important point. And linking them to harm reduction, right. needle exchange, uh, as well as opiate substitution therapy, trying to address the problem of addiction, which is uh, really the bigger issue. So, uh, Ira, there's another group you mentioned about after cure, and that's the cirrhotic patient. You, you didn't magically reverse all that liver damage in 12 weeks, yes. but yet patients are really excited about being cured quite appropriately. What do you, how, do you deal with, how do you deal with that group? What do you tell them? Well, first, let's acknowledge that it's critically important, incredibly important to patients to uh, be assured that their liver disease is not only stabilized, which I've always thought was a wonderful message to be able to share with them, uh, but they want it all. They, they want to know that their fibrosis, all that damage is going away. And so it's a pleasure to be able to tell our patients that the liver has these marvelous dissolution mechanisms for scar tissue available, but that marvelous message comes with caveats. We can't predict how frequently it'll happen from in, in any given patient. It's about a 50% in five year rule, that 50, perhaps 50% of patients with various liver diseases, including hepatitis C, will demonstrably have regression of their cirrhosis, say if you do a biopsy in an investigational setting after five years. The number may even be higher, as we've learned in hepatitis B. 
But that doesn't get you off the hook, and we mentioned this earlier in terms of hepatocellular carcinoma screening. We'd love to identify a point one day at which, say, if your fiber scan score goes down from Y to X, below the cirrhosis range, even if you were there before, that you no longer need HCC screening. It'll take years and thousands of patients to convince me that we should stop because we do occasionally see, albeit at a greatly <coughs> reduced incidence, post-cure hepatocellular carcinoma. And the fiber scan scores, which I rely on a lot, can be tricky. It's been shown, for example, that a reduction in fiber scan to less than that 12.5 kilopascal cutoff is not a guarantee that if you do a liver biopsy, as has been done investigationally, that the cirrhosis is really gone. Mm -hmm. It may be there still about 20 or 25 percent of the time, according to one recent study. So, um, but the patients still insist on getting their fiber scans, even when I tell them that it's not going to change our approach. They, to a person, they all want it, and I completely understand that. And most of the time, we get back a reduced score. Some of that, we now believe, is due to a reduction in necroinflammation, which mm -hmm. itself can uh, reflect liver stiffness. But often, it's probably due to regression. And we're just learning about the kinetics of regression of fibrosis, at least as measured by elastography. Well, that's a great point. We really didn't cure that many people with old therapy. So it's only been since 2014 or so that large numbers of people, particularly cirrhotic patients, are, are achieving viral cure. And we're learning about regression or healing of the liver, as you point out. But we are recommending ongoing liver imaging, typically ultrasound, as you pointed out earlier, every six months in that group. And they say, well, when can I stop? And I tell them the same thing you did, which is, at this point, we need more data. So are there other messages you tell people who have been uh, successfully treated? Well, I should append to my comments that I see the patients with cirrhosis once a year. Um, not to do a fiber scan, even though we end up doing them a lot, but it's my best way of ensuring that the patients are indeed getting that screening done. And occasionally, because other health issues or perhaps issues related to medications that somebody else wants to put the patient on where the preexistence of cirrhosis might make a difference. Beyond that, uh, to answer your question fully, uh, we still believe that for patients who've had demonstrable varices before, especially large enough to be uh, treated, that we ought to do an occasional endoscopy after that. We don't know yet what the rate of regression of varices is. It, it's not universal, certainly. I see plenty of people with varices that still need to be banded or, get, or treated with beta blockade uh, as the years go by. It is fortunately rare, but not unheard of, to see patients have a variceal bleed after virologic cure, unless they have another liver disease. So two things to add to that. One is there was a very interesting study recently looking at new listings for hep C-related liver disease. And already, in just a few years, we've seen a decline in the number of patients being added to the transplant list in the United States. So we are having impact in this patient population. But I think it also highlights that we'd much rather identify a person before they develop significant fibrosis. When the liver becomes damaged, you're dealing with a much more complex medical scenario. Mm -hmm. We want to get people with early disease where cure rates are high, complications are low, and we don't have to worry about the types of things you just outlined. So the last point I want to cover today is really that group that doesn't respond. Uh, do we have treatments coming that will offer uh, a potential for cure for someone who failed the first line regimens we've been using? Ira, how are you dealing with a person that failed therapy? Uh, first, by reassuring them that other treatments are on the way. And in fact, for patients who just have to have something else now, we can try to get them a regimen, whether it's the same one they've gotten, but for a longer time, or perhaps with the addition of ribavirin in this mm -hmm. case, or maybe a standard regimen with something else added uh, that they may not have taken before, like cefospivir, if you can argue what your way into getting it with the carrier may be worth trying. But for most of my patients who failed, um, I add the reassurance that it seems uh, quite likely that other regimens uh, will become available uh, shortly that can salvage, as we like to say, uh, most or, or nearly all of the patients who have failed. And we saw a publication in New England Journal of Medicine of a, uh, a triplet tablet of sofosporin, valpatazvir, voxilapavir, in persons who failed first-line therapies, as you know, yes. led to cure rates of 96% across the board. So really, Indeed. Uh, so I agree with your point about reassuring that group. Uh, Trang, are, are you treating people now who failed, or are you waiting for those new regimens that are coming? 
Well, we follow the ASLD guidelines on hcvguidelines.org, where if they're non-serotic, um, we will wait for updated guidelines. If hopefully, with the new regimens that are coming out, that's probably going to show up in the new guidelines soon. Um, but if they are serotic, we are pushing through with treatment, um, like Dr. Jacobson mentioned, uh, a prolonged treatment regimen with the addition of ribavirin so that we can, we, and we found that that has been working, although we have a very small subset of patients that have relapsed. And we have cured patients as well as that context, but it does remind me to highlight the fact that the best chance for cure is that first regimen. Right. Trang, you mentioned the, tr the treatment readiness uh, algorithms but really making sure someone adheres to therapy. And we find that if someone takes their full course of treatment, there's an extremely high probability of cure. So these are really times where we need to identify people and link them to care. It's, it's really important to get people access to these treatments. Right. Well, that ends our discussion for today. We've taken hepatitis C from the undiagnosed patient. We've given them antibody testing, we've linked them to care, we've provided treatment, we've cured them, and we've talked about some of the challenges thereafter. I want to thank both of you, Trang and Ira, for what's been a really engaging discussion from A to Z. I think we've covered pretty much every topic. Uh, there's a few we didn't get to, but we'll save that for future sessions. Thank you for your, your participation. Well, it's an honor to serve on a panel with you, Dr. Jacobson and, doc and Dr. Sokowski. Thank you. It was great to be with both of you, too. And we hope that you found this activity useful and can take some of this information back into your day-to-day -day practice to provide better care and improved outcomes for patients with hepatitis C. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at www.peerviewpress.com forward slash gdq. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Gilead Sciences Incorporated.